Welcome to the Top 100 Shortcuts for Logos 8 Parts 4 and 5, and we're thrilled that you could join us. And before we get started, I just want to address Freddie's question on the preferred Bible. This is a really important question to be addressed, and if you don't set this up right away, it can be really inconvenient. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go up to the top left where the library icon is, and I'm going to left-click and drag that to the center of my layout so my whole screen fills up with that gray shaded area. Now that my library window is open, over at the far right, there's three dots. Go ahead and click on the three dot option menu. You'll see in the menu there's an option called prioritize resources. Go ahead and click that. Now, I already have a whole bunch of prioritized resources. That's why you see this list very filled up. And in my Logos 7 training, we cover all those. You'll see that I have five or, or more Bibles right here in the beginning. Now, my preferred Bible, the first and foremost one, should be at the top. So what you want to do is type in your favorite Bible translation, in this case, the NASB 95. Once the Bible shows up in the list, then you want to left click and you want to drag over to the right. You'll see that there's a line here, so that lets you see exactly the position you'll be dragging and dropping. And then you're going to release. Now, it's impossible to duplicate in this list. So if you already had the book in the list like I did, New American Standard was second, by dragging over to the right, it moves it to the top. Now, it should be mentioned that Logos has a lot of auto reports. And it will draw from the first five Bibles in many cases. So you want to go through and find and select your top five prioritized Bibles, your preferred Bibles and put them in the order that you would like to see. So that way, when the reports run, they're always going to be your favorite Bibles first at the top of the list. Now, after you get three to five English Bibles, I do recommend selecting your preferred Greek Bible as well as your preferred Hebrew Bible for those instances when it will draw from the biblical text. Very, very important. Okay, so hopefully, Freddie, that answered your question, and we're ready now to get started. We are in shortcut number 53, and what I want to do with this one is go to the timeline. So we're going to go to Tools, and we're going to type in the word Timeline. So Tools, Timeline. Now this particular shortcut is important. So what we're going to do is we're going to go over to the far left, put in a date, let's say 100 AD, zoom in to the number of years you want to see to the left and to the right. Now I'm zoomed in pretty much where I can see plus or minus three years, a total of six, seven years. And this allows us to zoom in and see all the events for a particular time. And if you keep hitting that plus symbol, you can really narrow it to the exact year. And again, dates are subjective based on scholars' research. But nevertheless, this puts you in the ballpark and allows you to quickly see a lot of events in a single period of time. That's a very handy feature and comes in handy. And we're going to go to the next shortcut, number 52. Now, along the same lines of time, we're going to go to Tools, and we're going to type in Biblical Event, Biblical Event Navigator. And we're going to click that menu option. Now, what's nice about the Biblical Event Navigator is it allows us to type in a person, place, thing, and it will take us to that section. So I'm going to type in Joseph. I've been studying him on the weekends. We take a bunch of men through the book of Genesis, and right now we're in chapter 41. And so we hear by typing in Joseph, anytime Joseph is mentioned in the biblical events, we have a list here. Now, this could be any Joseph, Joseph of the Old Testament, son of Jacob, or Joseph of the New Testament, father to Jesus, husband to Mary. Let's scroll down, let's go back to the top of the list, and let's pick a particular area or time in Joseph's life. Let's pick the one where it says, Joseph is sold into slavery. So I click that. Now we get some cross-references, very handy. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to click the title, Joseph is sold into slavery. Now here's what's going to happen. First thing it's going to do, it's going to open up the fact book, and it's going to give me more information. This is really handy. Now, I could go to uh, the library results and look at dictionaries and try to get more dates and times, but that really won't work. So what I have here is an expression, and that is Joseph is sold into slavery. So what I'm going to do now is go back to my timeline, 
And what I'm going to do is put in some of those keywords from the fact book. So Joseph sold and slavery. Now, notice I've got two hits, but I can't see anything. That's because we zoomed in. So I'm going to click on the word fit. And I'm going to choose show all matching events. Now I've zoomed out. And we have two dates, an early date and a late date. So I want you to see this connection between the biblical event navigator, the fact book, and the timeline. These three can work together to help you find dates and times. Unfortunately, Logos has not coordinated all these in one single place. So you kind of have to jump around in order to get the data you're looking for. But I wanted to show you that because having a good handle of all three of those, the timeline, the biblical event navigator, and the fact book, you can quickly find information, dates, and times. Very useful. Okay, let me go ahead and close down the timeline. Let's return back to Logos. Let me close these two items. And we're in the section where we're still looking for shortcuts, getting summarized data clearly and quickly. So the next one is tools and it's names of God. This is a cool little feature. So type in names of God, then click names of God from the interactive media. And what I'm going to do is left click on this tab and drag it to the middle of my screen so that the shaded area fills up my whole layout. Now, the way this works is we're going to click the A to Z. That makes it easier to find things. And we're going to look up Hagar. So we're going to go to the speaker section. Notice we can click on names of God, language, but let's go to speaker. And uh, Hagar is in H's, so I'll need to click on more. I'll scroll down, and once I find Hagar, I'm going to click on her. Now, notice there was a number two next to her. You can see that right there. And this basically talks about Hagar and the name she uses. So here we have Genesis 16, 13. Then Hagar called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, You are the God who sees. For she said, have I even remained alive here after seeing him? So she uses the name Yahweh, but also ascribes to him, you are the God who sees, which is the El Roy. So this is pretty cool. And you can float your mouse over the Hebrew and you can see El Roy there. So what this is helping us understand is the names of God in context. Now I'm going to click all to erase Hagar. And I'm going to click next on the first one, 24 elders. Now, there's a real neat feature here as you're selecting through these different ones. We can click on address C, who's he speaking to, or are they speaking to. We can look at things that are related. We can even click on themes. So I'm going to click on eschatology. And here we have the 24 elders categorized under the theme of eschatology. And we see them in Revelation 11. We give you thanks, O Lord God, the Almighty. There it is. And notice the word here that we have. This is Panta Krador. This is a different word than the other one where we have, O Lord, your God, or O Lord God, curious. So here, Almighty's got this unique word. In the Old Testament, I think Almighty was El Shaddai. So this allows you to organize and understand what individuals Think about or themes related to the names of God. Great summarized data there. Let me go ahead and close that down. Now, the next one is systematic theology. Now, I've already have it open because it takes a long time to load, depending on any systematic theology books you have and how fast your computer is. So go to tools and just type in theologies, plural. And you're going to see these systematic theologies. Go ahead and click on that. And in a few moments, it'll open up. This helps me understand the theological or denominational bent of a particular systematic theology book. I'm going to click A to Z so I can see the authors of each book, but here's the denomination. So I've got one Adventist, three Anabaptist Mennonites, 13 Anglican, 29 Baptists, etc. If I click more, I can see the Reformed, etc. So I really like that capability. I also can look at the era, that is, the time in which the content was produced. This becomes very important. So I'm going to click on, for example, the Reformation. Now I've got 23 Reformation era systematic theology books. I now can go up to the top under author and I can pick whichever author I want to focus in on that. So this is really powerful and it can tell me 
a little bit about the book. So if I click on John Calvin, notice that the denomination now has been reduced to one, Reformed. So this tells me that John Calvin is the author of a systematic theology book during the Reformation, and he is Reformed in his theology. If I uncheck or click the X next to John Calvin, and I click denomination, Modern Catholic, we have here the Summa Doctrine Christania, and this is by Petrus Canesius. And so he's a Jesuit, founder of the Jesuit colleges. Keep in mind, this book is in Latin, so kind of renders it a little bit unhelpful. So you have to use Google Translate to get that information there. Okay, so Freddie's got a question. Is there anything dispensational? Well, let's go ahead and click the all, and let's take a look. So technically, dispensational is not a denomination. And what you're describing is a type of theology. And Logos really needs to add that category because there's Reformed theology, which is definitely a type of theology. But then you have Reformed as a denomination. And that's probably where the confusion comes from. So to find dispensationalism inside a particular systematic theology, we would search for that. Some Baptists would have it just because of who they are. That would probably be the way to find it more easily. But you'd have to search for it, which is unfortunate. So I would definitely, Freddie, make that suggestion to Logos because that would be pretty handy if they had theological bent rather than just simply denominational bent. So this is a quick summary of those tools. Very helpful. So I'm going to click the X on the tab to close this down. Now, these next three are really important when you get into the original manuscripts. Logos has put together a Hebrew Bible Manuscript Explorer. And the way you access that is Tools and just type in Manuscript. That's the easiest way to do it. And then you'll see you'll have several options. Uh, you'll have Hebrew Bible Manuscript, New Testament Manuscript Explorer, and Septuagint. We're going to go ahead and go to the Hebrew one. Now, here's what's going on. You have uh, the contents, you have the group, the dates of the manuscript, the language of the manuscript, the script itself, various tags, and the institutions holding the documents. Over at the right, though, you have the name of the famous manuscripts. Now, they might be papyruses, codexes, etc. Scroll. You have contents. You have the dating, and you have the group. This is really important. Now I'm going to click on the Codex Leningrad. Now when you click on the triangle next to it, it expands and gives you some additional information. Now the contents are codes for describing what books of the Bible they include. So in this case, H for history, uh, L for law, prophets P, the 12 prophets, T, and wisdom and poetry W. And if we expand it, as we've just done here, we can see those listed there. So this can be really helpful. There's also links to online locations where you can view the physical manuscript as well. Some of these require passwords. Some of them do not. So it'll be case by case. Now, where this comes in handy is when you're looking at the original language and you're, there is a dispute on the text. So what you can do is you can pick, let's say, law and get down to those manuscripts related to the law. Then what you can do, unfortunately it doesn't have any more grander detail than that, you can at least pick the century. So you'd want to go to the earliest, let's say uh, 200 to 100 BC. So we can click on that. Now we've got our oldest manuscripts right here. And these would be mostly Dead Sea Scrolls. But we could click on Dead Sea Scrolls to even reduce the results that way. And we can even include those that have images or are available in Logos. So I'm going to do has images. Now we're getting down pretty narrow. So here's some of our oldest manuscripts. And when we click on it, we can see the information. Now, it's sometimes helpful that they do list the name of the book here. So here's Genesis D. And if we click on Genesis D and you have the resource, Logos will open it up. And uh, what's really nice about this is you can see the digital transcription. And here we go. And if you click somewhere on the verse, the first verse, you can see which verse is in there. So Genesis 118, 119, 120, 121. And I'm just clicking on the row 24, 25, 
126. So it looks like it goes all the way to 127. So 118 to 127 is this. So what we could do then to have some fun with this is we could click on library icon, type in the BHS, and just open up our BHS Bible. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. It doesn't matter which one you open. Now, this does require that you know how to read Hebrew. But let's go to Genesis 1.18. So now we can look and see what's the same, what's different, or where it picks up. And in this case, here's this word right here, and that picks up right here. So we're, we don't have this fragment in there to the right, but we do have all this. And now we can see where the discrepancies are. That's pretty cool. But let me do something else just for fun. So I'm going to go to Tools, and I'm going to put in Text Comparison. Tools, Text Comparison. Now, I'm not sure if this is going to work. I wasn't planning on doing this, but the thought did come to my mind. So I'm going to type in BHS in the search box. Let me uncheck all these and get rid of all of them. Got quite a few Bibles in there. All right, so I'm going to put in BHS. And uh, let's see if we've got the one open right here, 4.18. And let's expand that. There it is. So there's the BH 4.18. Then I'm going to put in 4Q4 Genesis D. There we go. So there's 4Q4 Genesis D. What I have done now is I've got two of them side by side. I'm just going to click Save and click Save again. And Logos now should put them together. I'm going to click on verses and go to interlinear. And in this case, it's not accepting this as a doable option. So I'm going to go back to verses. You can see that when we enable the viewing of the what's in common, what's not, it can really dramatically change the view, as you can see there. So this is pretty handy because it's telling you what's in common and what's not. And that can be visually very helpful. So be aware that you can populate the text comparison with the different translations. Now, I won't do that for the Greek and the Septuagint, but I did want to show you this is possible to do. So if you are into looking at the original manuscripts, definitely take advantage of this tool. All right, so let me go ahead and close down the Hebrew Manuscript Explorer.